So with chapter 25, um, I'm going to recommend that you uh, don't get too bogged down in the details of the history of life on Earth. I don't want you to worry too, too much about what the textbook has to say about it. I mainly just want you to like take a look at almost just a survey of the history of life on Earth through this lecture, and then you know possibly look through the diagrams that are in the textbook as well. Um, some of those diagrams are here. Uh, just to kind of take a second and, uh, well, firstly, just appreciate the history of life on Earth because there's so much there and there's so much that we are nowhere near understanding to its fullest. And so it's really just interesting and I think important to kind of take a step back from what you think you know and realize how little you truly do know um, and realize how little humans have really been around on this planet. And so this slide is kind of a breakdown of what you can expect to see in chapter 25, but I don't want you to think you have to be an expert at any of this. So for instance, it talks about uh, knowing hypotheses for the origin of life. That's great. You don't need to be an expert in every little detail of the hypothesis. Just know overall how one of the hypotheses of the origin of life um, has kind of come to its conclusion. Uh, you need to know the age of the Earth. You do need to know how old the Earth is. And roughly when prokaryotic and eukaryotic life emerged. So I don't need exact dates here, just like an overall timeline, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like. Characteristics of the early planet and its atmosphere, that's going to become important when we talk about how life evolved. Huh? How Miller and Ure, and so Miller is the big name, Stanley Miller is who you're going to see a lot, tested this hypothesis named after these two scientists, the Operan and Haldane hypothesis, uh, and what they learned by testing it the methods used to date fossils and rocks. You don't need to know that very well. I've already introduced you to some of those ideas like radiometric dating. You don't need to be able to do any of those calculations yourself. I do need you to know some evidence for endosymbiosis, but you've already seen that before when we were talking about organelles. Okay. And then how continental drift can explain current distribution of species as well as the dis distribution of fossils. Okay. And then how extinction events open habitats that may result in adaptive radiation, something I touched on in the last lecture on speciation and extinction. So a little bit about what Earth was like early on. Okay. Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and the first life forms, to the best of our knowledge based on the evidence, was about 3.8 billion years ago. So there was no life for, you know, 0.8 billion years, as far as we can tell at this point. So that begs the question, if there was 0.8 billion years of no life on Earth, what caused that to change? What caused life to arise? So during the early, early eras of the Earth, small organic molecules got synthesized. And those small molecules eventually might chain together to form macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids. And this is not like a shocking thing. Okay, We've actually seen some of these macromolecules that have formed on meteorites in the middle of space. Like if there's enough materials and enough time and often enough energy, then you're going to get molecules forming, macromolecules even, so organic molecules. And so we've seen those happen in outer space. So this isn't you know, shocking. This shouldn't be shocking. Um, and basically those macromolecules got packaged into what we are going to call protocells, which are basically like membrane containing droplets, just very small little droplets. And then eventually some self-replicating molecules, some molecules that could copy themselves, evolved, or I should say were formed, were synthesized, and that allowed for traits to kind of be passed on. Okay. And in general, the best evidence suggests that the first genetic material was not actually DNA. It was probably RNA. And the first catalysts, so the first things that would actually like create that RNA, synthesize that RNA, I should say, <clears throat> excuse me, were ribozymes. So not ribosomes, but ribozymes, right? So like enzymes that act like ribosomes. Okay. And so there were a lot of interesting ideas tossed around in the scientific community about how this might have happened, right? And so Oprin and Haldine 
Hal Dane, excuse me, came along and said that, hey, our early atmosphere was a lot of water vapor, a lot of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, methane, and ammonia. Uh, so that was what our early atmosphere looked like. And there was energy on the planet in the form of lightning. So there was storming happening, even though there's no living things. There's still storms, right? And ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And those conditions favored the synthesis of organic compounds. So basically, like within the Earth, even though there was no living things, organic compounds were being formed because we had all of these molecules up here as like reactants and then we had energy to allow the synthesis of organic compounds with those reactants okay. so that takes us to miller and urey so miller and urey basically tested that idea so they tried their best to simulate the conditions of the early earth's atmosphere in a lab and so that sounds really complicated but when you boil it down it's it's really not Right. So basically what they did is they put all of those molecules, all of those substances into a container and then they had some electric sparks to simulate lightning. And then they, of course, had different things like you had to have water condensing, you had to have rain droplets, etc. They basically tried to create a miniature little pre 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 life Earth. Okay? And what they were able to do is basically synthesize amino acids in that little lab setup. So they were able to make the building blocks of proteins in that lab setup, thus supporting the idea that perhaps these complicated amino acids, these complicated organic molecules could have formed in a primitive Earth. Okay. Now, when it comes to protocells and self-replicating DNA, you don't need to be an expert by any means. But basically, we use evidence from the fossil record to try to reconstruct history, right? So we can look at different fossils and different rocks and try to figure out what Earth and life was like at the time. And so the sedimentary rock of the Earth forms these layers that we're going to call strata. And there are mineralized little pieces of body structures that we can see. Okay. So the reason this is important is because we can track living life forms in the fossil record all the way back from way back here. These are our earliest fossils. They're mostly stromatolites, which are basically like those little layers, so strata, right? Um, those are the little layers of basically prokaryotes that are just kind of built into the sand, if you will, uh, into the sediment, I should say. And so it's just like little evidence of single-celled organisms way back here. And this is a really incomplete record, right? So we have these big gaps where we don't really have any good fossils because I've mentioned this before, but fossils don't form very often, especially when you're talking about single-celled organisms. It's very unlikely that they have enough hard structures to fossilize right because like some tissues are just too weak to actually fossilize they get broken down and i've mentioned before the difference between relative dating and radiometric dating when it comes to fossils you do not need to be able to do any calculations about like using half-life to figure out how old the sample is or anything you should just know that we use these methods to figure out how old rocks and fossils are okay so when we start talking about earth this is, this gets really difficult because it turns out humans are really, really bad at thinking about very long timescales. Humans have not been around for very long at all. So what I have here is an analogy of Earth's history in the form of a clock, as you might think of it. Okay. So if you look along this circle, okay, we have different timelines for when things happen. So right here, we have the origin of the solar system and of Earth. Okay, So like right before 2 on a clock, we have the origin of solar system and of Earth. And then right before here on our first quad in our first quadrant still, we have prokaryotes evolving. Okay. So prokaryotes are our original organisms, right? Single celled, no uh, organelles at all, etc. And then a long time after prokaryotes evolved, we finally start to see atmospheric oxygen. So we finally have O2 in a decent supply in the environment, or excuse me, in the atmosphere. 
And that's actually caused by the prokaryotes because we start to get prokaryotes that produce oxygen through stuff like photosynthesis, right? And then way, way over here, we have single-celled eukaryotes finally evolving. Uh, and single-celled eukaryotes were around for a long time before finally something decided like, hey, maybe if we work together with multiple cells, and of course they didn't actually decide this, right? This is all random chance and then natural selection takes over and all that jazz. But finally we have multicellular organisms occurring right here. Okay. Those have been around for a long time, but not as long as single-celled eukaryotes or prokaryotes, right? Animals don't show up until way over here on the clock, right? Way over like around 10 o'clock. We don't have, or we don't have animals until around 10 o'clock. We finally have the colonization of land way over here, closer towards 11 o'clock, right? And then if we look at humans, humans have only been around this tiny little sliver right here. We've barely been here, okay? All of this other stuff has happened way before we got here, okay? And I don't expect you to know any numbers for this, neither does the AP test. I just want to give you an idea of just how little humans have been around for. Um, there was a lot of really cool stuff that happened that we have no idea of. And so to just kind of put this into more of a linear timeline, something that our brains can kind of more easily digest, um, here we have a timeline that's represented by millions of years ago. So when it says 4,000 on the left here, that's actually 4,000 million years ago. So 4 billion years, right? And so it's kind of hard for us to like make those conversions in our head, but it's important that you're able to do so. So like at 3,500 millions, that's actually 3.5 billions of years ago. So way over here, we have the origin of Earth. And then that's just alone for a little while. And then 3.5 billion years ago, roughly, we have our first prokaryotes. Okay? So our first single-celled organisms. And then finally, 1.4 billion years later, we get our first eukaryotes. Okay? So this is 1.4 billion years later. That's crazy. Okay? That's an insane amount of time where just prokaryotes existed. Right. And then 0.9 billion years ago, we have some of those eukaryotic organisms kind of having multiple cells make them up. So we have multicellular eukaryotes. And then, <coughs> excuse me, only 500 million years ago, we finally have colonization of land. So that's by fungus, by plants and by animals. Okay. Um, throughout some of that time, we have some really important events like the Cambrian explosion. So this was basically a gigantic event of adaptive radiation where a ton of organisms, specifically animals are what we're most concerned with, but a ton of organisms diversified and speciated. And so that we just saw a huge increase in the diversity of life during that explosion. It's an explosion of diversity. Uh, I know it sounds like it should be like a scary, um, you know, extinction event, but it's actually a, the opposite. It's a giant speciation event. And so now that we have these prokaryotes 3.5 billion years ago, they are starting to synthesize their own stuff. They need to do chemical reactions in order to survive. And one of those chemical reactions results in oxygen. And so slowly, slowly, slowly over time, about 2.7 billion years ago, we see that oxygen has started to accumulate in the atmosphere. And that's one of the reasons why eukaryotes were able to really be successful right? Especially the eukaryotes that we know of now, like fungi, plants, and animals. Those are only possible as is because of the oxygen that was made available by those prokaryotes. Okay? Everything else relied on it. Humans have only been around for about 200,000 years. So we're at the very, very tip here, right? We haven't been around very long. A ton of stuff has happened before us. So that takes me to the endosymbiont theory. This should be reviewed from chapter six. Right? And basically, some of our uh, organelles that we are familiar with formed when small living things started to live inside of bigger living things. So small prokaryotes lived inside of what would become eukaryotes, right? So we had mitochondria that was actually just a prokaryote, as to the best of our knowledge, the best of our evidence. Mitochondria was a prokaryote that a eukaryotic cell swallowed up and then decided to keep around so that they could kind of have a symbiotic relationship. And that's why it's a symbiont theory. So we have endo meaning inside and symbiont meaning they're living together and it's a symbiotic relationship. Okay. So remember words have meanings, 
Okay. Remember that there were different lines of evidence to support this idea. One is that these organelles replicate by binary fission, which is exactly how prokaryotes replicate. They have their own DNA that's different from all the other DNA, and it's circular. Okay. It's just a single chromosome, and it's circular, which is just like prokaryotes. And they have their own ribosomes to make their own proteins, just like a prokaryote would. And their enzymes are actually similar to living prokaryotes. And finally, they are double membraned, meaning that if they were to get swallowed up, they would have that extra membrane along the outside. So basically, all of the evidence supports the idea that these were once prokaryotes that were swallowed up, right? Phagocytosis. And then instead of being broken down, they were allowed to stay inside of that eukaryotic cell. Now, your book will talk a little bit about Pangaea as a supercontinent, and it'll talk a little bit about continental drift. Basically, the only reason we care about that for biology is because the Earth used to be this much larger landmass surrounded by a much larger single ocean, right? Whereas now we have landmasses that are separate more separate, I should say, from one another. And so that's important because when it was one giant supercontinent, organisms could move around more freely. And then when it separated, organisms couldn't move around as freely. And so we'll see fossils that match up over here and over here. And that only makes sense if they were once together. It doesn't make sense if a animal that could not fly or swim could be both in South America and in Africa. Right, that just doesn't make any logical sense. So that's really the only context you need to know Pangaea for this class, and hopefully that's review. I talked a little bit in the last lecture about mass extinctions. Just remember that there have been five major mass extinctions, and we are currently in the sixth one. And basically every time we have a mass extinction, so that's when the number of uh, species just drops like crazy because our, our extinction rate shoots up. Okay. Um, Anytime we have that, after that, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of resources around. And so we'll typically see the exact opposite. We'll see like a cycle of extinction and then speciation, extinction and then speciation. So we'll see a lot of things die and then a lot of new things show up. Okay. So that takes us to this really interesting form of research that's happening right now called EvoDevo or evolutionary development biology. Okay. And so this is basically the study of the evolution of new body forms or new um, body structures due to changes in DNA or changes in the regulation of certain genes. So there are some special genes that you're going to get introduced to. Uh, and so these special genes basically allow us to change an organism much more quickly than we would if we were just doing random mutation. Okay. So I don't need you to know this term heterochrony very well, but it's basically just our evolutionary change in rate of development events. So basically, like, if we start developing a lot of new limbs or a lot of new body structures in a lineage of organisms all at once, that's what we would refer to as this. Okay? So, like, we saw a lot of different face structures and skull structures change uh, at a similar time. We saw gills changing, etc., and basically, it's all due to these homeotic genes. So these are like master architect genes. These are the genes that tell your body as you're developing where to put everything. Okay? So some example are Hox genes. Those are the ones you're going to hear of the most often. Basically, they tell everything where to go. Okay? And so when you're just a little blob of cells that hasn't really differentiated yet, your Hox genes tell your body, okay, here, put a leg. Here, put the other leg. Here, put the arm, etc. And so we can do some really cool stuff if we just do a single change to a Hox gene. We get huge monumental effects. So just a single mutation here normally wouldn't have that big of an impact. It might change like one protein. But instead, we actually get a huge difference. Instead of just having six limbs, we can now have many more. Right. And so we've done other things with Hox genes. Like we have manipulated Hox genes. We've changed Hox genes to basically tell a body to grow an eye on a fly's leg. And so while the fly is developing, it'll just make an eye on its leg. And it works. Like, the eye can see. But it's all because we did one little change, and then the body just 
took care of the rest. And so this can cause really, really big changes in organisms as they develop with relatively small mutation numbers, right? Like we just do one little base pair change and then it has huge implications. So this is one of the reasons why uh, we see really, really quick speciation events at those points. Um, this introduces just the last vocab term and you know, exceptations. So exceptations are basically just structures that evolved for one reason and then they become co-opted for something else. So like the example is bird feathers. To the best of our knowledge, bird feathers first evolved to allow them to remain insulated, you know, some kind of thermoregulation, basically staying warm, keeping their body temperature what they needed it to be. But then over many, 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 many years and many, 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 many generations, those bird feathers were co-opted, meaning that they were used for a different purpose and that purpose was flight. So their original purpose was not flight. And that's why like most dinosaurs that couldn't fly had feathers, right? But then having feathers allowed some of those organisms to eventually fly. So it's just when something like evolved for one reason, but now it's being used for another reason. It's just another vocab term that unfortunately you have to be familiar with. But luckily, chapter 25 is really, really brief uh, on the stuff that you actually need to, you know, quote unquote, memorize. It's mostly just gaining an appreciation for the history of life on Earth much less so than memorizing specific dates or anything. Please don't memorize any specific dates about, and except for how old the Earth is, which is 4.6 billion years. That's pretty much the only date you need to know. All right, so with that, that's going to be the end of Chapter 5, and then Chapter 26 is going to be all about phylogeny.